we right? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Senate occasional lecture. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where we meet and pay respect to all Australia's Indigenous elders, past and present. I'd also like to remark on, on the, uh, well, my gratitude to the weather gods again. Those of you who are regular attenders here will know that uh, we've had a string of really foul Fridays for our lectures over the past few occasions. And I'm therefore very grateful to all of you for venturing out in the, 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 the rain and snow and sleet and hail and ice. I exaggerate, uh, and, and coming along to today's lecture, because I'm sure you will be very pleased that you have made the effort. Those of us with an interest in, in politics, both here and abroad, I suppose we've spent the, the past couple of decades more being absolutely um, taken aback by developments throughout the world in the emergence or the re-emergence of, of uh, political parties, the, the resurgence of nationalism, the impact that that has had on, on world events. We look at the UK, for example, with UKIP and its impact on Brexit. I mean, who would have ever thought that Britain might vote to leave the common market, as it was called in my childhood? Um, the Scottish referendum, another really interesting development. In Canada, uh, a second generation of Trudeaus is, is uh, in power. Our friends across the, the, the Dutch have been doing some really interesting things with proportional representation and a new electoral system in the 90s. Now, behind all these developments, I suppose, that the, the impact of uh, uh, and the shape of political parties is a huge uh, influence. And uh, today, to give us a, a broad view, to, we're going to step back and uh, have a look at some of the developments over the past 10 years in political parties. And um, from a comparative point of view, the UK, Canada, New Zealand, uh, and of course, Australia. And uh, what some of those developments might mean for the development of our own political parties. I'm very pleased today that we have Annika Goya with us to talk about these matters. She has made uh, a study of these things over, over many years. Annika is Associate Professor in the Department of Government and International Relations at my alma mater, the wonderful University of Sydney, and she's widely published on the area of political parties, their regulation, and the sorts of things that, that uh, make them tick. So today, to speak to you about party reform and where Australia's political parties might be headed in the future, would you please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Annika Gaia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr Lane, for the invitation to speak to everyone today. I'm really reassured by the size of this audience. It's like six or seven branch meetings put together. Uh, and for those of you laughing already, you know what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to start my lecture with uh, this man, who I think has really sort of captivated uh, not only the United Kingdom but the world over in, in the previous months and indeed the last year since he rose to power in the UK Labor Party. And indeed for those of us who have been looking at UK politics, we all know that last weekend Jeremy Corbyn was re-elected the leader of the UK Labor Party in a vote that attracted the participation of more than half a million people. And this vote, and Corbyn himself, was a product to reforms to the Labor leadership selection process that were instigated back in probably 2011, but followed through in 2013 and 2014, um, which created essentially a one member, one vote process and expanded participation in the selection contest to party affiliates and supporters. Now, Corbyn's election has elicited two very, very different responses from political commentators and the general public, both in the UK and abroad. For some, the process has reinvigorated the UK Labor Party, substantially increasing membership and enabling hundreds and thousands of individuals to participate in what's seen as a grassroots democratic movement. For others, 
the reforms have seen the party hijacked by its supporters, or what's also termed its instant members, who paid merely a few pounds to vote in the leadership selection contest, which elected a leader who has little broader electoral appeal. Now, the experience of the UK Labor Party highlights two very important questions that I want to explore in my lecture today. The first is what motivates political parties to undertake organisational reform? And the second is what are the consequences, both for the parties themselves and for representative democracy more broadly, once they actually undertake those reforms? I'm going to take you today uh, through some of the research that I've conducted over the last four or so years on political parties, particularly looking at the democratisation of their organisations. And I'm going to draw on examples today from the United Kingdom, from Canada, from several other established democracies, and share the experiences of a variety of different political parties. And because political parties are notorious in trying to improve their own organisations by copying what is seen to be successful in other contexts, Understanding the experience of political parties elsewhere, I argue, really helps us understand where Australian political parties might be headed in the future. Now, thinking about the overarching place of political parties in today's democracy, there are two key motivations uh, for the research and for the lecture that I'm going to present to you today. The first is to better understand how political parties are responding to technological, social and institutional changes. And secondly, the effectiveness of some of the organisational changes that they have made in order to ostensibly increase citizen participation and engagement in their intra-party processes, and by doing so, continue to ensure their relevance as participatory organisations in modern democracies. Okay, here's the sobering slide. Um, perhaps the, the greatest concern that overshadows studies of political parties today is the complete collapse of formal party membership. For political parties such as the German Social Democrats, the halving of their membership since the 1990s has created what has been described as beyond catastrophic circumstances, which mean that party reform today is more urgent than ever. The decline in party membership impacts upon how we might think about political parties and party organisational change in a number of important ways. The first is the sheer pervasiveness of membership decline, which has been shown to affect parties both across democracies and across party families. So parties like social democratic parties, green parties, conservative parties, Christian democratic parties. And the table, the graph that I'm displaying for you now, uh, basically you don't need to really see the details of that, but what you can see quite obviously is the slippery slope of formal membership decline. Each of those colours represents a different party family, and the overall trend is for a steep, steep drop since the 1950s. So rather than being a specific problem that is faced only by some political parties, it's now a broader fight for institutional survival. And this highlights not only the salience of the trend, but also the complexity of their problem as encompassing social changes that transcend states and parties with different ideological standpoints and very different organisational histories. Another aspect of the pervasiveness of this decline is the extent to which membership decline impacts upon party functions. So members, uh, both in party scholarship and looking at how parties represent members themselves, have traditionally been seen as a committed group of activists that promulgate a party ideology as a source of outreach and policy innovation and as a provider of financial and campaigning resources. So insofar as dwindling party memberships affect the performance of political parties' participatory and representative functions, they also raise much broader questions about the continued capacity of political parties to enhance the quality of democracy. Adopting perhaps a less sanguine perspective, perhaps the most important role that party members play beyond campaigning uh, is creating a sense of legitimacy for a political party. So where does this leave parties today? Well, while there's broad consensus on the pervasiveness of membership decline, scholars disagree as to the consequences of what this might mean for the future of parties as linkage organisations, and indeed whether membership is actually necessary for political parties at all. 
Some scholars question the golden age of the mass political party, regarding it only as an atypical historical episode, while others highlight what is seen as a changing organisational dynamic within parties themselves, where members still exist but have become increasingly marginalised at the expense of an increasing dependence on the resources that are provided by the state. In this view of what parties have become, public funding is paramount and sustaining a large membership is more about validating the legitimising myth of party democracy rather than in parties themselves remaining true vehicles of linkage between elites and society at large. And yet another view, and this is probably unsurprisingly the one that's espoused by the political parties themselves, is that members continue to remain a really important source, um, not only of support, but of vibrancy and legitimacy for party organisations in the contemporary era. Now, if this is true, if parties still make a commitment to party members, then that begs the question, well, what does membership itself mean in the modern era? In 2013, the UK Labor Party assigned House of Lords peer and longtime trade unionist Ray Collins to conduct a review of the party's organisation. The review, called Building a One Nation Labor Party, was charged with reforming the party trade union relationship and the leadership selection process under the auspices of what the party described as building a truly 21st century party. Now, the report argued the continuing importance of party membership, Collins noting that members are the lifeblood of our party. It is essential that the rights that come with membership are recognised and understood. Party members play a crucial role in holding their MP to account, selecting their parliamentary candidate, selecting the leader and deputy leader, picking delegates for annual conference and much more besides. Now, at the same time, however, the organisational changes that the Collins Review recommended involved opening up the Labor leadership selection process in such a way that members' crucial role in leadership selection was actually substantially diluted. Under these reforms, the three-way electoral college that had existed since 1981 in the party, which comprised of members of the parliamentary party, party members and trade unions, was replaced by the one-member, one-vote system where the votes of Labor parliamentarians, party members, affiliated union supporters, and most importantly, registered party supporters were just aggregated and weighted evenly. So by individualizing union affiliation and introducing registered supporters, building a one nation Labor party aimed to grow the party and to realize former leader Ed Miliband's vision to, and I quote here, mobilise these individuals and build Labor into a mass party, growing our membership from 200,000 to 500,000 to 600,000 or more. While Ed Miliband's leadership ended after the party's 2015 general election loss, his vision for the party may have come to fruition, but perhaps not in the way that he originally expected. In 2013, when the reforms were first announced, UK Labor Party membership stood at 190,000 people. In 2015, a group of over 552,000 Labor supporters signed up to participate to select Miliband's successor, Jeremy Corbyn. So why is this particular reform important for the future of parties? Well, it's important because it departed from the previous recruitment strategies the party had used to adopting a much broader understanding of the concept of membership and I'll explain what I mean by this. First, by individualising the practice of union affiliation, the party sought to grow its membership by converting previous collective affiliates into individual supporters, effectively achieving an instant injection of members through redefining the notion of affiliation. Second, by expanding the leadership franchise to registered supporters, the Labor Party expanded the notion of membership in a functional sense. So when I mean functional sense, I'm talking about allowing non-members to participate in activities, decision-making processes that would once be reserved just for the formal party membership. Uh, and in doing so, it created a much larger base of support to legitimise and promote the leadership selection. Now, this vision of growing the party was both foreshadowed and encapsulated very nicely by Ed Miliband when he announced the review in 2013. And he argued that I want to build a better Labor Party by shaping a party appropriate for the 21st century, not the 20th century in which we were founded. 
Understanding we live in a world where individuals rightly demand a voice, where parties need to reach out far beyond their membership. Now this quote from Ed Miliband uh, is interesting also because it acknowledges the reality that citizens' preferences for political participation, so the ways in which they like to do politics, are changing, and that political parties need to respond to this. So what are some of these changes? Well, scholars suggest that citizens' political behaviour is becoming more individualised, driven by social changes such as increasing pressures on time, money and effort, a decline of working class communities and trade union membership, people are less willing to participate in collective forms of political activity. So rather than joining political parties, citizens have instead turned to other political organisations to channel their political participation or to undertaking direct forms of political action. For some, these changing patterns represent the decline of political participation and engagement in society. But for others, they signify a diversification in citizenship norms and participation away from primarily duty-bound norms and actions to more engaged and autonomous forms of political participation and to expanding political repertoires that are no longer focused exclusively on the formal institutions of the state. Now, the practical manifestation of this change can be found in the rise of individualised or micro-political forms of participation, such as donating money, signing a petition, or purchasing particular types of goods without the need to interact with other people. An individual's tendency to engage in these actions is influenced by their relationship to his or her lifestyle, which means that issues are both constructed and responded to in a very personalised way. So in contrast to dutiful citizens who see elections, governments and formal political organisations as at the core of democratic participation, these new self-actualising citizens have weaker allegiances to government, form loose networks for social and political action and focus on lifestyle and issue-based politics. By consequence, individual political actions are less likely to involve formal membership, but rather a preference for joining selective actions and in citizens displaying their participation in these actions publicly, increasingly through the use of social media. So where do parties fit in this brave new world? Well, before we get too optimistic about their future, the figures contained in the table on the screen are a stark reminder of the overall insignificance of party and partisan forms of participation for Australian citizens. What I have here are the results of an essential media poll that was conducted in April 2014, where 1, 000, over 1,000 respondents from across Australia were asked about the types of political activity that they engaged in. A very small minority reported participating in parties in some way, whether as a member or by campaigning. Respondents showed some interest in signing an online petition, but by far the most common experience was to have undertaken no party activity whatsoever. Respondents were also asked in this survey whether they would consider becoming a member of a political party. Only 15% indicated that they would, and this was the highest among Greens voters. Men were twice as likely as women to say that they would consider joining, and by age, younger voters, so those under 30, were least likely to consider joining a political party in the future. There are two ways in which participatory patterns such as these might impact upon the nature of party organisations, particularly as arenas for participating in politics. The first is the potential withdrawal of parties from society. So faced with the prospect of declining memberships, parties might look elsewhere for resources, for policy input and for legitimacy. And this is the response which has received a significant degree of academic attention and is characterised by the notion of a hollowed out political party. One with greatly reduced organisational structures in which in within which party leaders communicate directly with the electorate by utilising mass communication strategies heavily resourced by the state or by their own financial resources. The second option is that parties change their internal structures and processes to better reflect these patterns of participation. Now this is the most difficult sort of avenue to think about because it might require a radical rethinking of what we mean by the notion of a political party as a mediating institution and where its organisational boundaries might lie. 
At the very least, both scholars and political parties need to think about undertaking a more nuanced account of what it means to be active within or engaged with a political party, one that moves beyond the notion of a formal party member. Last year, I interviewed our former Prime Minister, John Howard, uh, for this research, and he put the problem uh, that he perceived for parties very, very succinctly. He argued that I was the last of a generation of joiners. People don't join organisations in the way that they used to. It's affecting service clubs, affecting even volunteer sporting organisations, churches. People just don't join in the way they used to now. There's a lot of reasons for that, but to some degree, the phenomenon I'm talking about with parties is a reflection of a different society where people just don't join. So what can be done about this? Well, in party terms, a really nice illustration of a particular organisational reform that is designed to respond to these external pressures for change, and in particular, the shifting participatory preferences, is the creation of formal supporters networks. Now, at the beginning of this year, supporters networks or friends networks have been established by social democratic parties in Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Canada, Germany, uh, as well as the UK Conservatives and the New Zealand National Party. And this is just within the suite of Westminster democracies. The creation of these networks extends uh, much, much further to political parties, both in Europe, post-communist Europe, uh, and of course, North America, where these, a lot of these concepts actually originated. Now, these networks allow citizens to join the party in a reduced capacity free of charge or with a donation of their choice. Becoming a friend or supporter of a party uh, can also be seen predominantly as an expressive action. So, for example, supporters may publicise this action on Facebook and it doesn't require any commitment on the part of the individual and it offers people a means of formalising their support for the party without going so far as becoming full members. Now, this reform builds on the perception, as expressed by former Prime Minister John Howard, that it's the notion of membership that is problematic from the individual's perspective, rather than support for the party per se and its policies. Although it's often defined in opposition to membership or alongside membership, what supportership actually means and involves is very vague. So if we take the New Zealand Labor Party as an example, um, the definition of a registered supporter in that context is simply a person who agrees to have their name listed as such. Sometimes there can be very little functional difference between a member and a supporter, and this depends in part on how much individuals value the opportunity to participate in certain intra-party processes, and how parties themselves might want to balance the voices of certain groups. So returning to the UK leadership uh, election example. I think it's sort of really interesting to reflect back to 2011 when the idea of a registered supporters network was actually floated, uh, well, put to uh, the party conference. At that point in time, um, the refounding Labor document, which was an earlier review, which was approved by conference in 2011, stipulated that if the party could recruit more than 50,000 supporters, this would trigger these supporters being given 3% of the electoral college in the vote for the party's leader, which could rise to 10% depending on the number of supporters recruited. Now, flipping forward a few years, as a result of the Collins review, the vote of a registered supporter in a UK leadership contest, UK Labor leadership contest, carries equal weight to that of an ordinary party member. If we think about the eventual scale of non-member involvement in the leadership contest, it far, far outweighs what was previously voted on at conference and previously conceptualised and approved by the party. In 2015, over 100,000 registered supporters participated in the ballot, which in contrast to the 3% that was originally anticipated to have a share of the electoral college, it comprised a 25% share of the total selectorate. In 2016, uh, registered supporters comprised 24% of those voting in the contest. So this far outweighs, outweighs what was originally anticipated. In Australia, the Labor and uh, National Parties have involved their supporters in candidate selections through the trial of open primaries for the selection of parliamentary candidates in a number of state elections. Marketed as community pre-selections, voting in these primaries is a one-off event with supporters pre-registering to vote but with no further obligation to the party. 
But in both of these instances, what we need to think about is how these two groups, members and supporters, relate to each other and how participation in parties can be tailored to suit different groups and whether this, in fact, is something that's possible to achieve in practice. Now, the development suggests that if supporters are also gradually given rights in leadership and candidate selections, then the distinction between member and supporter may not be as clear cut as previously anticipated. As supporters are actively encouraged to contribute to policy debates and as, party move, as parties move to more consultative forms of policy development, the difference between members and supporters in this area of party activity seems even smaller still. <coughs> In Germany, the Social Democratic Party had a, a long debate in 2011 about how to reform its internal organisation to try to, again, sort of capture more members and re-engage people in party politics. And originally, the party leader, Sigmar Gabriel, proposed that a system of open primaries that would see non-member involvement in the party expanded to candidate and leadership selection processes uh, was proposed. However, following very harsh criticism within the primary that pro within the party that primaries would undervalue the point of, and I quote, proper party membership, and a very mixed reception in the press, this suggestion was retracted. Eventually, the compromise that was reached was to focus non-member or supporter participation only in policy-related activities, rather than include them in candidate leadership or other types of representational decision-making within the party. The UK Labor Party has also seen these networks, supporters' networks, create significant internal tensions within the organisation. So 10 years ago, in 2006, the Labor Party conducted a survey of its members contemplating the idea of introducing registered supporters' networks. The survey asked party members what they thought about the prospect of introducing a supporters' network. A majority of party members approved of the idea in principle, but when it came to giving supporters concrete rights within the party, the reaction was much less enthusiastic. Only one quarter of supporters supported the uh, one quarter of members supported the idea that registered supporters should participate in policy making. 11% were in favour of supporters having a share in deciding policy, and. Interestingly, for what is happening within the UK Labor Party at the moment, only 9% of members supported supporters having a vote in leadership elections. Within the sort of suite of Westminster democracies, the Canadian Liberals now present the most extreme example outside of the United States of the shift towards supporters' networks. So the party, which is currently in government in Canada under the leadership of Justin Trudeau, advertises itself not as a party, but as an open movement. In May 2016, the party quite controversially voted at its conference, but with the majority of support of conference delegates, to dispense with the notion of party membership entirely. So rather than having members, the Canadian Liberals uh, have a suite of registered supporters. So anyone willing to register with the party, which is free, can do so. And once they do so, they are able to participate in policy development and candidate selection, as well as leadership selection. Critics of the proposal, uh, of the reform rather, suggest that by dispensing with the traditional branch or writing based structure and replacing it with individual affiliation, the reform centralises power around the leader. For others, it has been seen as a sort of reinvigorating grassroots democratic movement. But parties are not just using the language of movements in how they talk about their organisations but also in appropriating some of the organisational and campaigning techniques of movement politics. And one of the most prominent examples that parties have used over the last five or so years is community organising. Now, originally this has been copied from advocacy and third sector organisations. And the basic principles of community organising are asking what people what they care about rather than telling them what to think. Uh, these practices have become fused in the campaign practices of US political parties in the last decade. Community organising, as American parties have borrowed and applied it, 
reflects a process of technological adaptation and of learning and diffusion, not simply between parties, but between parties and other political organisations that have creatively redefined organisational membership and pioneered novel fundraising practices. So what has successfully been used in the American campaigning context is seen as a source of inspiration to party organisations all over the world. And in a way, it's also employed to try to strike a balance between the participation of members and non-members in party organisations. So in the UK, for example, uh, the UK Labor Party has advocated these community organising initiatives as examples of best practice for engaging its local groups. One particular branch, the Folkestone branch, um, was advertised to the broader party organisation as being a branch that they could emulate uh, as an example of best practice. It led one of the local campaigns against parking charges in the town centre. It started with an online petition. The campaign spread to an offline petition in the high street that collected 2,000 signatures, progressed to a series of community meetings and culminated in a local council referendum. Lauded by the party, the campaign was able to successfully reinvigorate the local branch as members, and I'm quoting here, had a focus. Each week we would get ready to give a speech at a meeting or prepare for a radio interview or print more posters for the campaign. We found a new energy in the local party with new members taking the leading campaigns and long-standing members finding a new lease of life. So not only was participation within the party renewed at the local level, the campaign also succeeded in bringing the Labor Party into the public view and integrating supporters as, and I quote again, for the first time, we became part of the community and built bridges with other groups that we were working for, for the best interests of the town. Now this is participation and community organising at the local level, but translating this model of organising and participation to a national scale, particularly in the context of electoral campaigning, has proved to be much less successful for the UK Labor Party. One of the fundamental tensions inherent in this model of organising um, and between that and partisan politics is the tension between the decentralisation and autonomy of decision making practised by volunteers and local groups and the desire or the necessity of the party organisation maintaining control of groups, processes and policy agendas. So, as US scholars Sandy and Schultz argue, organising is not about doing for others. Instead, organisers are supposed to work with people to produce social change. A key tenet of this organising is that those affected by a particular social problem are usually best equipped to figure out what changes are most likely to make a real difference. However, as Nielsen notes of the US context, uh, campaign assemblages are trying to have it both ways to mobilise the masses associated with membership-based organisations while retaining the centralised control characteristic of management-dominated advocacy groups. Now, this tension was clearly evident in the 2013 UK Labor Party conference, which I observed uh, as part of the research. The conference um, incorporated a series of community organising training sessions that were led by US organiser Arnie Graf, who trained Obama in his organising techniques. Once questions were solicited from the floor, a number of party members in these sessions complained of the disjoint between community organising training, strategies at the local level and the priorities of the central party office. So despite instructions to forge community links and campaigns, a party member from one of the London constituency Labor parties spoke of interventions from central office aimed at blocking efforts to organise. Those canvassing were restricted to asking three questions of electors, to work from centrally generated lists. Volunteers were directed not to talk to non-Labor voters and could not target constituents between 18 and 24. Now the discussion was actually promptly shut down by a staffer uh, from campaign central office who deferred questions to a private meeting at the end of the session. These events, which happened behind closed doors at the party conference, illustrate not only the ongoing coordinations when staffers and volunteers have divergent ideas of how campaigns should be run and varying commitments and goals, but also the inherent contradictions between the principles of community organising and partisan politics. Now, the transfer of modes of organising from political advocacy organisations to parties and vice versa is not limited to offline activities. 
Importantly to the way in which parties structure themselves today and engage with their members and supporters has been the gradual uptake of social networking sites and online platforms to provide the basis for a different kind of organisational infrastructure. Now, for example, all of the three major parties in the UK have adopted Nation Builder as an online community organising software platform that enables parties to build campaign sites that incorporate communications, fundraising and volunteer management and profiling functions. And Nation Builder was also used by the ALP in its 2016 federal election campaign. Nation Builder, for those of you who, who are not familiar with it, is a US company which describes itself as a unique nonpartisan community organising system that enables clients to establish campaign sites at relatively low cost with a relatively low level of expertise. Nation Builder effectively traps into individuals' propensities to respond to issue based politics rather than ideological cues. Linking a party's page to a variety of different microsites that showcase different causes and campaigns enables users to engage with the party on their own terms, whether that be through donating, signing an online petition, posting comments online or campaigning offline. And in addition to online platforms such as Nation Builder, social media is playing an increasingly important role in how parties engage with citizens and vice versa. Now, the relatively personalised nature of these communications technologies is highlighted in comparing the ratio of parties to leaders' social media followers. Uh, the parties that I looked at in Australia, the UK, Canada, France, Germany, New Zealand, um, I found that in two thirds of cases, the party leader attracted a vastly greater following on both Twitter and Facebook than the political party itself. So, insofar as party, flat, party platforms such as Facebook and Twitter cultivate greater links between supporters and individual politicians, they suggest that the process of organisational reform may also be dispersing. So, individual leaders and celebrities within the party organisation possess greater autonomy and power to be able to um, adapt and create these sites uh, and to craft their own online links with supporters in a way circumventing party structures. These are low cost activities in that they can be implemented quickly by a, um, a parliamentarian, by a campaign staff, by an aspiring candidate, uh, and in many ways don't require the approval of membership or the conference. But in creating a more individualised and direct channel of communication between parties, politicians and the public, the organisational consequences are potentially far greater than the ease of the reforms would suggest. So the picture painted of the modern political participant, and hence a potential partisan, is someone who is time poor, reluctant to join a political organisation, most likely to engage with issues that affect his or her lifestyle than respond to ideological and collective incentives. Many of the initiatives that have been introduced by parties that I've spoken about to respond to membership decline assume therefore that the problem lies in the cost benefit ratio for individuals and that the solution correspondingly lies in lowering barriers, barriers to individual participation. But in evaluating the consequences of the reforms for both parties and representative democracy more generally, we need to consider two questions. First, are the organisational changes an accurate response to changing norms of political participation? And second, which is of a more normative character, is whether these reforms are an appropriate response to changing norms of participation. So in the Australian context, um, I conducted a survey of voter attitudes to partisan engagement in 2012, uh, which provides some evidence of the relationship between organisational change and community um, expectations. Now the survey was fielded to 1,200 uh, Australian voters and it was designed to reflect the views of the general population on the possibilities provided by party organisational reform. So the survey asked respondents to indicate whether or not they might consider engaging in a number of party related activities in the future. Because the survey asked participants about their likely rather than their actual political activity, overall rates of participation are likely to be marginally inflated. However, a number of interesting trends emerge amongst the various engagement items that I asked about. So unsurprisingly, joining a party is the least popular method of engagement amongst respondents, with only 9% indicating that they would be likely to do so in the future. 
By contrast, respondents were actually twice as likely to register as a supporter, although the overall percentage was only 18%. A large majority of, of um, respondents, that's 64%, said they were likely to engage in one partisan activity in the future, and that was answering a survey from a political party about the issues that mattered to them. This indicates that developing responsive consultation mechanisms is a fruitful way forward for parties in the future, even if it may not be the most creative thing that they could be doing. General interest in participating in primaries was a modest 17%, um, perhaps indicating that Australian citizens don't have uh, as much of an appetite for US style primaries as parties might anticipate. And around one third of survey participants expressed interest in engaging with parties by posting a survey comment online um, and attending a policy forum. So that was 33%, which also hints at the potential for individualised online communication and issues based engagement to be successful. So where are we headed in terms of the parties and the future? And this is the last point that I'll touch on today. The relationship between political parties and their members and supporters, as well as the relationship between the demands for political participation and the opportunities provided, are both symbiotic. In many cases, the two can't be separated, as when parties have focused on recruiting a specific type of member, they've actually contributed to transform what party membership and engagement means. Now, this observation raises the second of the two questions that I've posed. Notwithstanding the accuracy of parties' organisational reform processes, are they actually appropriate? And what kind of party will they produce in the future? One of the most prominent themes that I've noticed in my time researching parties is the reluctance of these organisations in which they describe and justify their reforms to depart from anything uh, but the modern party as a membership organisation. At the same time, however, the, co the concept of membership has also been evolving in several important ways, which, as I've argued, tend to blur this distinction in practice of the boundaries of the official party organisation. Through the introduction of alternate forms of affiliation, granting decision-making rights to non-members, policy consultations with the broader public, and the appropriation of issues rather than ideologically based community politics campaigns. In this way, parties can still maintain their, their status as membership organisations and benefit from the legitimacy and resources that accrue from a base of supporters, but the nature of the organisational link that members create between society and the state changes as a result. Whilst a significant minority of citizens indicate that they will engage with parties through new channels of participation in the future, there is no guarantee that the party supporter will become a sustained or an active follower in the future. Indeed, the very nature of the reforms uh, to party decision-making processes presume that individuals will dip in and dip out of engagement as it suits them. On the one hand, these new individualised links and intermittent participatory practices aren't actually so different from patterns of party membership in the past. Lots of comparative studies have shown that the majority of party members are actually, for the most part, inactive. And that's remained a relatively constant trend even after party members have been demanded, have demanded and been given greater participatory opportunities. On the other hand, however, when parties focus on issues at the expense of building collective identities, they may inadvertently contribute to the very problem they seek to solve, demobilisation. Indeed, the rise of new populist political parties, as well as those on the far left and the right of the political spectrum, and the mass mobilisation of citizens in democracies such as Greece and Spain in response to global economic crises and migration flows, have demonstrated the increasing and continuing importance of class, inequality and economic cleavages. So for social democratic parties in particular, the strategy of dismantling collective identities and affiliation to concentrate on individual issue-based engagement may have underestimated the continuing relevance of these broader issues and in the process left a large group of disaffected citizens by the wayside. So to conclude, I pose the question, in a climate of membership decline, are party reforms designed to reinvigorate the normative ideals of the mass party model of representation or has the breakdown of membership, coupled with social change, created a climate conducive to reforms that might fundamentally alter the way in which parties connect citizens and the state? 
While the UK Labor leadership example and many others discussed today suggest that parties continue to hedge their bets by appealing to both traditional organisational structures and new participatory processes, once reforms that seek to open up the party in various ways have been implemented, it's very, very hard to turn back. At the same time as party reforms respond to a new breed of political citizen, the high profile campaigns associated with primaries, with policy consultations, supporters networks, etc., work to potentially create a new set of normative ideals and change citizens' expectations of how they might associate with parties in the future. So the consequences of party reform extend well beyond the rule changes and well beyond the parties themselves in creating a new culture of democratic engagement for better or worse in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Annika. It's certainly a rich field and it's no, no wonder that you've been um, researching so widely on, on this topic. Um, we have a bit of time for questions and comments, and if you do have a question or comment, I'd invite you to come to the microphone. Oh, we've got a race. Uh, yes, you, you can wait to, there, and uh, I'll give you the call. So, so uh, you, you can be first, sir. Okay. Look, thanks for that uh, fantastic talk. I'm sorry I can't be a bit late. I didn't hear the first part of it. Party membership's declining. Yeah. That was the first part. Right. Um, what I'd like to um, know uh, a bit more about, if you can answer this, is just the relationship of those movement-type organisations in the UK which seem to be underpinning the rise and success of uh, Jeremy Corbyn and how that all sort of fits yeah. with your, um, you know, its relationship to, to, the, to the Labor Party. Great. Thank you. Um, well, just very briefly, um, what the Labor leadership selection process has done is enable groups, whether they be within the political party or outside the party, to organise uh, collectively to influence the outcome of the election. Now, I think this is really interesting and ironic in many ways um, in how it relates to the, uh, I was going to say, original intention of the reform. If we look at it Literally, it was to open up the political party. If we think about it cynically and strategically, uh, many would argue that these reforms are implemented in order to increase the power of the leadership. Now, at that time, that was Ed Miliband um, and, his, and his supporters. So really, in proposing the reforms and seeing them through, the party, I think, and the leadership has bitten off a lot more than it can chew in that it has centralised the power of the leader, not the leader potentially that it wanted, but it has also created ironically a process where you do give groups the ability to collectively organise and to join the party by sort of opening up the boundaries of what constitutes a supporter to collectively organise to influence an outcome. So I think that, that it has created a sort of a certain permeability between the political party and the variety of different movement organisations which have mobilised to support, to support Corbyn. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Is it back. possible that the uh, reduction in membership is because there is very little difference between political parties now and you really need a very serious issue to galvanise people into moving into a party as happening in Austria, for example, now, mm where they're moving to the extreme far right. Yeah, that's, um, you've pointed there. The, so the question went to th the, the fact that there's very, very little difference now between political parties. And I mean, that has been sort of the established logic of looking at parties and party systems for the last 20 years, that, that political parties are vote-seeking organisations that, uh, because they are vote-seeking organisations, they tend to target the median voter, which means that their policies inevitably converge. But I think we've seen in the last five or so years, post-global financial crisis, a real upheaval in a lot of, or a um, reintroduction of many of the old sort of social and economic cleavages that um, were seen to have been diluted over the last 20 years. So we have these issues that are re-mobilising, I think, and re-engaging citizens, but parties need to work out a way to actively respond, respond to them and incorporate them in their agendas. So one way that they can do that is through individualising their processes. Um, and in some ways, I think populist parties 
present a real challenge to established political parties in this regard as well. Because their organisations privilege the leader, they ostensibly have or champion direct democracy, so you know the expression and the will of the people. But because they focus on the leader and his or her you know, policy wishes, they're much more flexible and able to respond quickly to what they see as citizen demands. So I think certainly that this is going to pose these new challenges are posing a challenge to established political parties, but they also at the same time present an opportunity because they are there and they divide society in such a way that it becomes important for people to re-engage in democratic processes. So next we'll go to the gentleman in the blue jacket, then to you at the back, then to you, Ernst. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I was interested you mentioned the German example uh, you didn't mention the French example. Um, I'm particularly interested in that because I am a dual national of French and British, and I shall be able to vote electronically in the forthcoming primary for the pre pre French presidential election. Um, uh, this is a completely free vote. In other words, I don't have to be, I've never been a member of a political party. Uh, and all I have to do is I have to pay two euros for each round of the vote. Uh, and uh, I also have to subscribe to a rather wishy-washy statement to the effect that I, su I support uh, re republicanism, republican institutions, and so on. Um, I, I think this is quite an interesting uh, example because, of course, uh, as you uh, as undoubtedly know, the former French president is the president of the party, although, of course, uh, in France he doesn't sit in parliament, but it, it is probably unlikely that he will be uh, uh, chosen as the candidate in the primary. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll take most of that as a comment because I think that does provide a really, really nice example that uh, that I didn't have time to, to touch on. But I think the French the Socialist Party, when it first um, established its primary, interesting for a couple of reasons. The first is that I've been looking very, very carefully at all of the party documents um, when these initiatives are actually implemented. And what is really interesting to see is just how much they defer, I'm gonna say quite blindly, to the experiences of the United States. That what happened in Obama's campaign is seen as the holy grail, that primaries are seen as the holy grail of democratic participation. Now that was all well and good up to this year. <laughs> and what we've seen in terms of the primary race, um, sorry, the presidential, well, the primary place in the Republican Party, but also the presidential election more generally. So that's one interesting example in that even France had a deference to the, the US as sort of being the holy grail of democratic participation. The other is in paying the two and three euros, primary elections actually constitute a really important source of income for political parties that are floundering uh, in terms of being able to gather resources from the public. So French socialists, again, earned more than a million euros in running its first primary. Um, and I suspect the UK Labor Party made a handsome profit as well from billing its supporters to vote in Corbyn's leadership election both times around. Now look, I've got a bit of a queue building up here. I'll just explain. We'll go to the gentleman in the blue shirt at the back, Ernst at the front, you here in the front row, and then you at the back. <laughs> Take it away. Relating to the issue of funding of political parties, I'm just wondering what the implications are perhaps in the future for public funding of political parties. At present, uh, if a political party doesn't have uh, parliamentary uh, representation, the, it depends on the, well, one of the conditions is the number of members of that political party. I'm wondering whether that uh, could perhaps in the future move to, to the concept of supportership. And if I remember correctly, the issue uh, that re resulted in the conviction but later acquittal of Pauline Hanson was that very distinction between members and supporters uh, of the One Nation Party. Um, just, just quickly, yeah, the question raises a very interesting point and that is the relationship between formal notions of party membership defined as somebody signing a piece of paper saying that they're a member of that political party. And in Australia, 
establishing a political party, which requires at the Commonwealth level 500 members. Now we might think, oh yeah, 500 members, that's pretty easy to achieve. But these days, no, actually it's, it's not, particularly if you're registering a party as a state organisation in every single state. And so certainly I think that the way in which parties are talking about their support bases in terms of supporters rather than members, we might see a shift to parties trying to claim resources or claim registration on the basis of signatures of supporters rather than formal party um, memberships. In terms of the question of funding, of, of public funding of, of party campaigns, I think that um, that will continue into the foreseeable future and it'll also be done in tandem with trying to reinvigorate grassroots funding and crowdsourced political campaigns. If we move towards a system of primaries in the future, what I think is really interesting is the question of who's going to resource these. So in the UK, when the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats were elected to government, they actually made a pitch, and it failed, um, to fund 200 all postal primaries for parliamentary candidate selection contests. Now, as I said, that failed, but that was an attempt in many ways to get resources from the state to pay for these activities. In other cases, it shifts really the responsibility for fundraising from the party to the candidate because parties can elect to put caps on primary selection contests, but it's also seen, and again, drawing from US experience, as a very, very valuable exercise where candidates learn campaigning skills. They learn to fundraise. So a lot of the motivation for implementing this is not simply opening up an engagement, but it is bringing resources, bringing money in. So it was you next, Ernst, thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments. Early in your talk, you referred to the decline of political parties and you referred to people turning to other kinds of organisations. Now, one example of that in Australia would be GetUp, which has a large electronic base, seems to be able to raise a lot of support, financial support, and significantly to influence the political debate on a range of issues. I'd be interested in your thoughts on the implications for the political process of these kinds of organisations which play a part in the political debate but do not in fact participate in the electoral process. And on a second point, um, you referred to parties opening up participation, but I think most of your examples referred to parties of the left. Um, can you comment on why parties of the right are not engaging in the same opening up process? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, um, on, on the first question relating to other types of political organisations and the implication for democracy, um, I think there's a number of perspectives that you can take on it. The first is, well, the more the better, the more the merrier. Um, if organisations like GetUp allow citizens to express their political preferences and to participate in a meaningful way or what they think is a meaningful way in politics, then that contributes to the health of the political system. Um, there are differential practices, as you said, for how these organisations then contribute to elections and election campaigning. In New South Wales, for example, um, a distinction is drawn between these groups and political parties in terms of the funding that's received and the amount that they can spend on campaigns, where we clearly, in terms of formal electoral politics, have a two-tier system. Parties and candidates at the top level, um, third-party campaigners at the bottom level. The second sort of distinction that's drawn a lot in the academic literature is between whether to see these groups as competitive or cooperative. So competing for individuals' political participation, which in many ways, given that political parties have not really responded to shifting participatory demands, but organisations like GetUp are modelled on those changing demands, um, points to the fact that, well, yeah, parties may well be losing out in terms of their processes. But research that's been done, um, I've certainly looked at some of the overlap between, I've only looked at the Greens, but the overlap between Greens membership and GetUp membership, and it suggests that actually, well, no, people who are politically inclined are members actually of both of those organisations. So it's not necessarily a case of one or the other, but that it's a broader sort of um, social capital issue. If you're more likely to be active in one organisation, you're more likely to join a political party. So that distinction might not actually play out 
in practice in that it's a competitive um, contest. While you're coming to the microphone, I'll ask you to ask your question um, now. Um, Annika, thanks, Annika. That was, a, that was a great speech. And one of the things that um, you highlighted was the tension between bringing members in and parties retaining control. Um, what I was interested in um, was your discussion about how candidates are like, and these processes are becoming more personalised. Are party elites worried that as their um, marketing strategies become increasingly personalised, that they might actually lose control to their candidates as well? Yeah, that's, um, you've certainly highlighted a really interesting tension there. And I think political parties are still feeling their way through these different processes as a lot of different advocacy um, and political organisations are. I mean, that issue of control is not necessarily something that's specific just to party organisations, but also extends into the advocacy and social movement sectors as well. Um, I think that in terms of reconciling it, what we see is the example that I raised about community organisation uh, initiatives in the UK Labor Party really sort of highlights that tension. Um, and particularly that's a tension that's going to grow as social media becomes more prominent. Because one of the things that I didn't mention about Facebook, but I think is particularly interesting, is that platforms like Facebook, um, like Nation Builder, they are e relatively easy for candidates to establish and to create an account. But by the same token, what you then do is you outsource the responsibility for maintaining that account um, outsource a lot of the way in which um, the message is distributed to people on the network to the organisation itself. So in a way, you have a sort of a commercialisation of a lot of the campaigning functions as well, which not only creates problems of autonomy from the candidate vis-a-vis -vis the party perspective, but also problems of autonomy from the candidate vis-a-vis -vis the party and the reliance on the commercial provider in these situations. It's a fabulous discussion. Our time is running out, so this will have to be our last question. I'll, I'll be very, very brief. Uh, one of the most striking things, I think, about the uh, election of Corbyn in the UK has been a kind of a delegitimisation of the parliamentary wing, mm -hmm. because the attitude of the parliamentary wing to his candidacy was very well known uh, throughout the UK before the event. I wonder if you'd comment on that. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's certainly the case. And I think the Labor Party in the UK throughout its history has gone through periods where, like many social democratic parties, it has struggled with the relationship between the parliamentary wing and the broader party organisation. And I think that for the most of the, the 80s, the 90s and the 2000s, particularly under uh, people like Tony Blair, the parliamentary wing gained increasing importance and in a way, in many ways, in terms of policy, in terms of strategic direction, separated itself from the party's base. Now, um, whether or not, I mean, Corbyn on one hand, one side could be seen as a, as a re-correction of this particular phenomenon. On the other, um, it could be seen as a, a dangerous precedent as well, whereas the part where the parliamentary party loses control over some of the functions that it should more properly actually have control over vis-a-vis -vis the party membership. So I think, again, all of the questions today have raised really sort of difficult issues that I don't immediately have the answer to. And all I can say is that we're seeing that parties everywhere are grappling with these issues. Um, and the consequences have been that, yes, organisations are trying to open themselves up. They are getting more members. They are getting more supporters. But that tension between a supporter, the tension between traditional party membership is one that is really, really apparent and that parties have to find a way of dealing with in the future. Well, clearly it's been a very stimulating lecture, Annika. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your participation in the discussion afterwards. I think we've raised lots and lots of uh, very um, pressing and interesting issues that we can spend a lot of time discussing, but sadly our time is up. And uh, I'd invite you to continue your discussions amongst yourselves uh, in, in the time to come. Please join me in thanking Annika for a wonderful lecture. And look forward to seeing you all next time, perhaps with better weather. <laughs> <laughs>